This episode will help you tell the difference between real innovation and tech hype. We are going to cover lessons from a book called Competing in the Age of AI. We're going to cover what AI is and how it changes business models and how that helps companies make a lot more money. Welcome to the Tech on Techies podcast. I'm your host, tech entrepreneur, executive coach and Chicago Booth MBA, Sophia Mathieu. My aim here is to help you have a great career in the digital age. In a time when even your coffee shop has an app, you simply have to speak tech. On this podcast, I share core technology concepts, help you relate them to business outcomes, and most importantly, share practical advice on what you can do to become a digital leader today. If you want to have a great career in the digital age, this podcast is for you. Hello, smart people. How are you today? I have been spending an extraordinary amount of time with lawyers recently, and you know, I am not on trial for something scandalous because I haven't been caught. That's the key. But seriously, I've been approached by a couple of law firms who work with big tech clients, and they wanted to get some tech knowledge basically so they could understand their clients better and be better lawyers to them. And, you know, I thought this was such a lovely thing to do because in both cases, the law firms came to me. So the partners reached out to me and they asked me about what kind of workshops and learning programs I could deliver to them. And I think there is a lesson here for all professionals because the lawyers who reached out to me, they already work with the biggest tech clients. So they are already extremely, extremely successful. And yet they are still looking for new ways to understand the sector and to deepen their understanding of their clients. And they don't have to, because they're already successful. So this is what being proactive and going the extra mile looks like. And if they do this consistently, you know, that's why they're at the top of their game. And in my experience, the people who are the most successful in any field, they basically are more proactive and they just make more effort. Another example that I see quite a lot is that renowned business authors who already have an audience, who are already on various bestseller lists, they reach out to me themselves, not even via PR companies, but they reach out to me themselves, they send me their book, and then they pitch to go on the show. And they don't have to, but they go the extra mile. So my question to you from this is, where can you go that extra mile to reach your ambitions? And don't think that I'm telling you, oh, to add another two hours of work per day, because you're probably already working really hard. But where can you essentially take quite a small action that could have that big impact? So for example, is there an email that you're putting off because you assume that nobody's going to answer it or take you seriously? Well, give it a go. If you don't try, you'll never know. And also, for all those of you who are lawyers, I am teaching a free class at the end of February called Get Tech Clients, Introduction to Tech for Lawyers. It's based on what I'm teaching to the big law firms that I told you about. So if you're a lawyer or if you have lawyer friends, send them to the link in the show notes or just go to techfunontechies.co forward slash events and register for that free class there. Okay, so now let's get to today's lesson. Today we are going to cover the main points from a book called Competing in the Age of AI, Strategy and Leadership When Algorithms and Networks Run the World. You may have noticed that we are in a hype cycle around artificial intelligence right now. And this does not mean that the technology itself is not going to be revolutionary because I do believe it is revolutionary. But there is a difference between the potential of a technology in general and the specific value of a company. And from what I'm seeing, there are some real tech bubble characteristics around AI companies right now. So I would like you, my dear smart listener, I would like you to keep your heads in this AI whirlwind because some companies are doing amazing things and some companies are just bolting on the word AI basically in a rather cynical way. And I want you to learn to differentiate between real lasting innovation that could have business and commercial impact, and between what's basically really good PR. That's why today we are going back to basics. We're going to learn what AI actually is and how it changes business models, and thus how it helps companies make more money. Competing in the Age of AI is my favorite book on how AI affects business. 
It was written by two very smart people. They're both Harvard Business School professors, Professor Marco Ian City and Professor Karim Lakhani. They're both also really charming, which is quite rare for AI professors in my experience. Professor Ian City actually came on this podcast to talk about his research. So if you want a free HBS level lesson, scroll all the way down to episode 9. And the episode is called The Business of AI with Harvard Business School professor Marco Ianciti. So let's just scroll all the way down wherever you're listening to and you'll get that episode. Competing in the Age of AI came out in 2020. God, remember that time? Seems like lifetimes ago. So basically it was way before ChatGBT became the most downloaded app of all time. But number one, OpenAI was working on generative AI back then. So the fact that it's new to you doesn't mean that it's actually new, which I think is a good, interesting point to acknowledge. And the second point is that to understand how the current wave of AI will change business and bring investors billions of dollars, we need to see how AI is already changing companies from the inside. So the main premise of the book is that relatively simple AI has a massive impact. And even before the advent of chat GPT and generative AI in general, in the public arena, weak AI simple AI was changing industries from the inside. And I'll share a couple of case studies from the book in today's lesson. So listen to this. I'm about to quote from an article that the two professors wrote for the Harvard Business Review. It says, in 2019, just five years after the Ant Financial Services Group was launched, the number of consumers using its services passed the 1 billion mark. So 1 billion users in five years. Oh my God. Okay, that was an aside. I will continue. Spun out of Alibaba, Ant Financial uses artificial intelligence and data from Alipay, its core mobile payments platform, to run an extraordinary variety of businesses, including consumer lending, money market funds, wealth management, health insurance, credit rating services, and even an online game that encourages people to reduce their carbon footprint. And now, listen to the most incredible bit. The company serves more than 10 times as many customers as the largest US banks, with less than one-tenth the number of employees. I mean, 10 times more customers, with less than one-tenth of the employees? So lots and lots more revenue, with much less cost? That is living the dream, my friends. Now let's see how this happens, because I bet your ears perked up. We shall begin by defining terms, weak AI and strong AI. Well, weak AI, it does one task. So for example, the Netflix content algorithm can suggest a movie that you want to watch based on what you watched before and based on what other people with your characteristics also like watching. But that Netflix algorithm, as smart as it is, it can't also suggest that you should take the train instead of a taxi today because there has been a traffic accident and you're going to be stuck. So that's weak AI. And this weak AI, despite this, you know, weak name, it has already changed the world because weak AI also refers to the content algorithms in Facebook and in TikTok. And these have literally changed societies. Strong AI is a system capable of simulating human reasoning. And it can be argued that generative AI is strong AI because it can create something new and to some extent it can simulate human reasoning. Strong AI is the next generation of artificial intelligence and we are now in that next gen age. But watch out because these definitions of AI, they are the right definitions in 2024. But what I've seen in the AI world is that definitions change and they're not static. So it's not like the law of gravity because what was considered to be AI 30 years ago is not considered to be AI today. So it is a bit confusing, but you know, let's deal with what we've got in 2024. And now that we've defined tech terms, let's move on to defining business terms. Yes, I know this episode is going to be quite thick with knowledge and you may have to listen to it again. Also, oh, by the way, I'm, I've been meaning to tell you, we now paste the episode transcripts in the show notes at techfonontechies.co. So if you want to go over the concept, that written format might help. See how much I love you? 
this is why I would like you to leave a rating and a review for this show, because it does actually take quite a lot of work and effort on my part to create for you for free. All right, business. So basically, to run a business, you need two main components. You need a business strategy, which defines what you're going to make and whom you are going to sell the thing that you've made to. And the second thing is that you need an operating strategy, which defines how you're going to do all of this. So business strategy is the what, operating strategy is the how. For an enterprise of any size to be successful, you need an aim, which is the business strategy, and you need a plan for how to do it, which is the operating strategy. So I've thought of this example, which has nothing to do with AI. It is to do with fried chicken. (laughs) So imagine if KFC decides to expand to the health and wellness market, which I really hope it does not. But let's imagine they do that. They could have a strategy to market to health conscious people. And so they could get some recipes that they plan to cook and have a vision for how they're going to make a lot more money because their market is going to expand. Okay, so that's the business strategy. But if they do not update their operating model, this whole plan is going to be a total disaster because they would need to change their kitchens, because they're going to cook very different things. Um, They're going to have to have a new hiring and training process for chefs, because those chefs are going to need different skills. And KFC would also need to create relationships with a whole new bunch of suppliers, because they're going to need to buy kale and quinoa, not just batter and chips. This is why to be successful, you need both. And there is actually a quote in the book that I really like, strategy without a consistent operating model is where the rubber meets the air. So to sum up, a business model is defined by how a company creates and captures value from its customers. So what is it going to do and how much is it going to sell this thing for and so on. An operating model is all about how you deliver the value to that customer. So basically, what's the plan to get this business strategy done? And I'll show you examples a bit later on. AI has been changing how we get things done for years already. The bit of the business world that AI has been impacting is the operating model, how we get things done. This is the core point I want you to get from this episode. The reason why Ant Financial can serve 10 times more customers with one tenth of the staff is because they have a different operating model, which is powered by AI. They're different on the inside. In the book, the authors describe Ocado. Ocado is a British supermarket delivery company. And I know that this show has an international audience. So just think of Amazon because there are some similarities. It is also online delivery. But, you know, all of you can imagine what an online supermarket is. The business model for an online supermarket is that customers order groceries online and they get deliveries to their homes. So there are no physical shops and the shop front is a website or a mobile app. So great. Very convenient, but I think we can all agree that this is not really revolutionary anymore. But what is revolutionary is how Ocado works from the inside. And this is the operating model, because this company uses AI to make its supply chain incredibly efficient. And I'm going to read directly from the book here. It says, the key to the business is Ocado's centralized data platform, containing unrivaled detail on its products, customers, partners, supply chain, and delivery environment. The data is accumulated in the cloud and is exposed through easy-to-use interfaces by use by agile teams deployed to optimize every kind of application from delivery routing to robotics and from fraud detection to spoilage prediction. Okay, well, that was a mouthful of business jargon, but basically they use AI to tell when the milk goes off. Isn't that cool? Okay, now let's continue. All of this has combined to build a rapidly growing and profitable operation with a record of 98.5% on time delivery. AI algorithms are in the driver's seat of Ocado's operating execution, running thousands of routing calculations per second. AI makes sure that the company has a tightly predictable delivery model, optimized across its fleet of thousands of trucks, delivering in all weather which, as an aside, is notoriously terrible in the UK. Non-UK residents, what you hear is true. Anyway, I continue. The algorithms optimize truck routing in real time and make sure that the products delivered are fresh. So if you use AI in boring business processes within your organization, the business can run better 
and at a much lower cost than the competition. So you want that. So for the investors who are listening to this, ask your portfolio companies how they're using AI in their operating models and what their plans are in this area. That will make you sound really smart. Because essentially, they can cut costs by implementing AI in their operating model. They can become much more profitable, which will obviously be very interesting for you as an investor. This is why this stuff is really worth learning. I know that there is all this rage about generative AI. And honestly, yes, it is really amazing. But my dear smart people, the reason I'm bringing you this book today in teaching you these concepts now is that lots of companies aren't even using weak AI in their operating models now. And there is so much room for opportunity here, which is why I think we are living in a really unique age. And I do think it's really, really exciting. And the fact that you're here and listening to this podcast means that you want to capture this opportunity with me. And yeah, let's go do it. Okay, now I'm going to teach you the last bit of this lesson. So stay with me. It is going to be a bit full of information and terms. And if this next bit just goes over your head, don't worry, just listen once absorb the general point and then if you need to get more detail you can always go back and listen again or just look at the written out transcript in the show notes for this episode. All right so basically in order to have an AI-based operating model in a business so in order to have AI inside the business you need to have what the authors call an AI factory and I'll show you how Netflix does it because that's something that most of you are familiar with but essentially, Netflix is very different from Ocado, the online supermarket. It's very different from Uber, the taxi company. So the end service that these companies deliver is really, really different. But all of them have an AI factory inside them. So what I have noticed is that people who have worked in a company that's powered by an AI factory, they basically can transform jobs to companies outside of the sector, but to other companies that have this AI factor. So for example, I have a friend who worked at an insurance company as a data scientist and insurance companies, basically the smart insurance companies really do have AI factories inside them. And then she went to work for WhatsApp as a data scientist. So really, really different use cases, but both are powered by AI from the inside. Okay, let's get to the Netflix case study. So Netflix uses data and AI to decide which original content to make. Isn't that amazing? The first time that they did this was all the way back in 2013. Over 10 years ago, Netflix used AI to see whether making the house of cards was a good idea, and they also used it to predict how big the audience for the series would be. And now let's look at what you need for this to happen, whether you are an online supermarket, a fintech company, or a transport company. There are basically four components that make up an AI factory. So the first is data. You need data on your users and on how they behave. So in the case of Netflix, you obviously need demographic data. And also you need data on what kind of genres people like to watch. And by the way, I heard that codifying genres is actually really hard at Netflix, which shows the importance of having good, clean data. But that is a whole other lesson. Okay, so let's get to the second component. The second component of an AI factory is algorithms. You need machine learning engineers to work with domain experts to create algorithms that use the data that you collect. And there's plenty of room for non-technical people to participate here. So don't just leave algorithm development to engineers alone. I'm a non-technical person and I have co-created algorithms with machine learning engineers. And it's actually a really, really fun and very interesting exercise. So if you ever have the opportunity, go do it, because I do actually think it's a really fun thing to do. But then again, maybe I'm super nerdy. I don't know. You be the judge of that. Okay, right. You probably know about the first two components of the AI factory already. So let's make it interesting and then add the other two. The third component of an AI factory is an experimentation platform. Basically, this is the bit where you test whether your algorithm is good or whether it's a load of rubbish. So, for example, you could feed in data about an existing series that Netflix has already made. I don't know, like Narcos, for example, which I thought was excellent. So you could feed it in and then you could see what the algorithm predicts about it. If the prediction that the algorithm makes is close to what actually happened and what actually happened with Narcos is that everybody was watching it, then obviously your algorithm is pretty good. 
But if if the prediction is completely off and doesn't match reality, well, then you need to tweak it. And you know what? I'm actually on the advisory board of an AI company that does this, and they're called Riveter. Riveter uses AI to predict consumer trends, like the colors that people will want to wear in three years' time, for example. And they've been around for about 10 years. So they can actually prove that their predictions are correct because they can look at what people are buying from Zara today and they can show that actually it matches the prediction that they made three years ago. And I think it's actually quite insane because, you know, there's me being like, oh, I am such an original thinker. But according to Riveter, not so much. And you know what? I actually had a really good interview with the CEO of Riveter on this very show. We talked about advisory boards. The episode is called Advisory Boards, Why Join Them and Why Have Them. It's only 20 episodes ago. It's episode 170. So you could literally just scroll down a bit. But also I linked it in the show notes. And now, what is the fourth component of the AI factory? I hear you cry. Well, wait no more. I shall tell you. So component four is software infrastructure. Basically, it means that you need to collect all of that data that you have in your company in one huge bucket, as opposed to keeping it in lots of different little buckets that don't speak to each other. And this sounds really simple, but actually, it's where some of the most heated issues arise, because people get really protective about sharing data. Like, I've seen instances where the marketing department doesn't want to share their full data set with finance because they hate the finance people and they don't trust them. And like, this is an actual thing. Um, And I think it's really interesting because what I find, um, the thing that I find stands in the way of the AI revolution and successful digital transformation is actually not technology, but it's just plain old human behavior. We have our petty squabbles, we've got our fiefdoms, we've got our human incentives. And usually it's these human factors that are the hardest to work with, not the actual technology. Okay, so we are, we're about to land this plane. We're coming to the end of this lesson. Obviously, my dear smart people, I do recommend that you read Competing in the Age of AI because I think it's an excellent book. And I mean, you should see my copy. It's covered in post-its and underlining, and it is very well thumbed, but it is not a light bedtime read. I've pasted the link to the book in the show notes, but if reading this book is just not going to happen in your life, don't worry, I've got two ideas for you. So the most simple one is listen to my interview with Professor Ian Siti. It's episode nine and it's called The Business of AI with Harvard Business School Professor Marco Ian Siti. Listening to this episode, it's literally the easiest thing to do since you are already listening to this podcast. And to go a step deeper, I cover the concepts from the book in my courses on tech for business leaders and tech for non-technical founders. You can get these courses on demand at techfulontechies.co or get in touch if you want a tailored version for your organization. And on that note, my dear smart listeners, well done for listening to this. I do know that this was quite an information packed lesson today. We had lots of definitions and we had lots of terms and you could have been watching cat videos and TikTok and instead you decided to invest in your education. So maybe you need an ice cream after listening to this. You know, I find that ice cream is a really helpful aid to intellectual endeavors. But whether you get ice cream or not, well done for investing in your education today. I'm really proud of you. And if you found this lesson valuable, please do leave the show a rating and a review. It helps spread this work to other smart people so more people can learn here for free. And also, reading your reviews really does make my day. Honestly, it does. I love hearing from you. It's one of my favorite things. So be lovely and leave a rating and a review on Apple or just a rating on Spotify. And on that note, have a wonderful day and I shall be back in your delightful smart ears next week. Ciao.